Okay, for this class session, we're going to just kind of wrap up with some important other regulations that exist that relate to nonprofits. Um, these are not uh, actually anything to do with taxes, but they're just uh, some other bodies of law that are kind of similar to or relevant to the stuff we've been talking about. So we're going to bring them up here in this last class session. The goals for this session, I want you to know the, requ the requirements of incorporation, meaning if you want to be legally incorporated, what does it take? I want you to understand the concept and requirements of qualifying to do business in other states. If you're a Utah corporation, but you do, but you have offices or do business in other states, then there's some things you need to know about. And finally, or sorry, third, understand the concept and requirements of business licensing in municipalities. If you're going to have an office or a location in a, in a city, then you need probably need to comply with their business license requirements. And then last, know the requirements for charitable solicitation registration in multiple states. So there are about 40 states where if you, actually Nevada just joined this list, where if you uh, solicit donations in that state, then you have to register with the state and comply with their solicitation laws. So let's talk about home state requirements. Um, the two of them I want to talk about are incorporation and business licensing, two of the things in our list there. Um, basically, if you want to exist as a corporation, you do it because the state says you exist. The state essentially gives you a corporate charter, and we've talked about this idea a lot. Um, pretty much every state requires an annual filing to maintain your corporate status. In the state of Utah, it's super simple. Basically, you get a little postcard in the mail with a code on it. You go to the state website, type in the code, and then you pay your fee, and your corporate status has been renewed. Um, now, it, it's really simple, but you'd be surprised at how many organizations uh, forget to do this. Well, this is what happens if you forget to do it. You uh, go into a, 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 a suspended, suspended state for three months, and then if at the end of three months you don't renew your filing, then uh, your corporation is automatically dissolved. Well, that's obviously a royal pain in the butt, because if your corporation is dissolved, it brings all kinds of things. Like, for example that you're supposed to dissolve, wrap up all your assets, that you're supposed to pay off all your creditors with the remaining assets. And then if you're a nonprofit, the, the whatever's left over, those assets has to go to another nonprofit or to a state agency. So don't do this. Just make sure that you keep your corporate status maintained every year by renewing with the state. That's really all I have to say about the requirements of incorporation because a lot of organizations forget to do that simple thing. Um, the other thing that happens in your home state is that you need to file a, uh, a, a local business. You need to often get a local business license. This is a right to operate or have a location in a locality like a city or, or town. Um, usually it's also an annual filing to maintain your, your local license. Uh, in a lot of cities, nonprofits are exempt from license requirement or they have to obtain a license but they don't have to pay a license fee. Um, states or cities usually do this mostly to make sure that all businesses or other business-like activities are in compliance with zoning laws, right? Because you can't open an office in the middle of a neighborhood that's going to violate the zoning requirements. And so they use business licensing as a means both for that and also for public safety. Because if you have like a retail location where people are coming, then they'll send a public safety officer to make sure that your re retail location satisfies all public safety requirements. And so if you're operating in a locality, make sure you satisfy the local business license requirements. Um, this is You have to license even for a home office where it's just you working from home. But if, it's your, if you're running a nonprofit out of your house, then you need to satisfy the local business requirements even then. All right, that's it on that subject, on those two subjects. Let's talk about qualifying to do business in other states. Um, Basically, the requirement in other states is that if you're going to, if you're, let's say your home base is Utah, but you operate in Wyoming, Nevada, and California. Uh, so you're incorporated as a Utah corporation, but you're doing business in these other states. All those other states will require you to do something called qualifying to do business. And this is a requirement for all corporations, regular or nonprofit. And, um, and, and this requirement comes when your contacts in a state um, other than your home state, exceed some level. So like there are things you've done that give rise to this need. Now, if you just sort of send a sales guy through the state once, that's probably not enough to require qualifying to do business. If you just have a website set up and people from another state are buying things through your website, again, that's not enough to require qualifying to do business. But, uh, but if you do any of these things, like have a bank account in the state, if you have an office location, if you have employees that work there permanently, or you engage in what the state would consider to be a substantial commerce, 
then at this point you do have sufficient contacts in the state and they're going to require you to qualify to do business. Well, what does that mean? It means that you're going to do a filing um, just like you would um, to – it's a lot like the filing you do to keep your corporate status active in your home state. And in that filing, you'll just tell them who you are and what you do, what your address is, and what you're, op what you're doing in the state where you operate. A lot of the reason they do this is because they can then impose corporate income taxes on you um, if you're earning money in their state um, and uh, maybe other legal requirements. Um, qualifying to do business does have an upside, and it's that it allows you to use the courts in that state. If you're a foreign corporation and you're suing somebody in another state, you usually have to qualify to do business there before you can use the courts. Um, also, qualifying to do business creates um, – so when you file a lawsuit against somebody, you have to provide service of process. And what that basically means is you have to provide them with a copy of the lawsuit in a, me in a mechanism that's – that brings it to their notice. And a, a and a benefit for consumers of requiring businesses to qualify to do business in the state is that it means they have a registered agent in the state where you can serve the lawsuit in the home state. So for example, GAP I think is headquartered probably in Delaware, if I was guessing, and maybe headquartered in California or another state. If you wanted to sue the GAP, normally you'd have to deliver the, a copy of the lawsuit, hand deliver a copy of the lawsuit to them in their home state. But because the GAP is qualified to do business in Utah, you can use their Utah um, registered agent, um, which makes it easier to sue them. And that's important for people that need to sue big companies. All right. Um, last, we are going to talk about charitable solicitation registration. Basically, the way this set of laws works is every time you solicit donations in a particular state, you have to register before soliciting donations there. Um, it works in the following way. It's required in about 40 states. Um, I, I'm not sure now technically if it's 41 because Nevada just barely last week passed a law um, requiring solicitation registration. Um, there's an article in the National Tax Journal that places compliance costs at about $1.1 billion annually or an average of about $4,300 per charity. And let me tell you why that's so expensive. It's because this registration process in most states is like doing your taxes there. And in fact, it's like doing your taxes 40 times over every year. Um, when I was a law clerk working at Grameen Foundation USA, um, that was one of my jobs that the general counsel gave me was working, was doing the registration process for, for Grameen Foundation. And we found that it was a pain in the butt. It took me about three and a half to four weeks of full-time work to get all these registrations completed. Um, now here's the scariest part, are you ready? Um, what if you are a Utah nonprofit, but you have a website where you invite people to donate, and then somebody from California reads your website and your appeal for a donation? Does that mean you have to register in the state of California? Well, this has never been tested in court, but all the state attorney generals got together. They get together on a regular basis, and they sometimes issue legal opinions. And one of the opinions that the state attorneys general issued says that if you have a website soliciting donations, then that is a sufficient solicitation that will require you to register in, in every single state. So if you have a website asking for donations, the, the state attorneys general say that you need to register in all the states that require it. Um, they do give you a way out, uh, which is to, um, they give you a way out, which is to disclaim solicitation for all the states where you're not registered. So if, if like, you have this website that says, you know, hey, donate to us, we, we do good work, you, on that website you'd have to say, this solicitation is not intended for residents of, and you'd list all the states like California where you don't want to register. And that's, that's obviously not ideal. Um, in fact, it makes you look suspicious, but there you go. So like I said, this has never been tested in court but it is the prevailing opinion of the state attorneys general that would come after you for not registering. So there's that. Um, there are different ways in order to complete this solicitation registration. Um, one is to do it yourself. You can download all the state forms from all the different states. This is obviously really time consuming and messy. Another option is to use what's called the URS, which is the Uniform Registration Statement. This is another do-it-yourself solution with a little bit less redundancy. There's still a lot that is redundant here because some states will accept the URS form for the first year but not for renewals. Other states will um, require you to file an addendum with your URS, meaning you have to fill out extra paperwork anyway. A lot of law firms that do this as a service actually 
don't even bother with the URS because it doesn't save nearly as much time as it should or could. Um, finally, the last option is, like I just inferred, is to pay a professional. You pay a lawyer or accountant. This can be expensive. Um, most law firms are gonna, that do this service are going to do it for anywhere between $7,000 to $12,000 to register you nationwide. Um, the, the thing about that about that is that fee doesn't actually include the, this, this, the registration fees you have to pay the states. So you're going to pay the law firm or accountant $7,000 to $12,000, but then you also have to pay a few thousand dollars in, to this to this to the states where you're registering and the state fees vary from state to state in Utah it's 100 bucks in in Georgia it's up to $400 depending on your income level and so uh, you can see this is a pain and to show you how messy this is and this this chart is a little bit outdated I haven't brought it up to date but this shows you all the different things you have to do to register in various states. So if you go down my list to Utah, you can kind of barely see the text is really small. But in Utah, to register to solicit donations in Utah, you have to do the following. You have to pay a fee. It's 100 bucks. You have to complete a unique state form, meaning you can't use the URS. You have to provide them with a copy of your determination letter from the IRS that says you're tax exempt. You have to provide them copies of all contracts with professional fundraisers. You have to give them a copy of your bylaws, and if you amend your bylaws, you have to send them updated copies. You have to also include copies of your articles of incorporation. You have to give them copies of all your 990s. You have to, above a certain income threshold, you have to perform an audit and give them a copy of the audit. And the forms that are sent into the state have to be signed and notarized by now get this, by the CEO, CEO, president, and chief financial officer of the nonprofit. And in fact, look at all the ones that require notarized signatures. Now this is a huge waste of money and effort. Uh, in fact, the research shows that these laws provide very little consumer protection, um, but, uh, but, it, but it's the law anyway, so you have to comply. Also, the kind of irony here is that most nonprofits are in non-compliance when it comes to these laws, meaning they're not filing, um, even though they should be. In the state of Utah, if you're caught soliciting donations without having registered, they'll give you, they have a two-strike policy, meaning the first time they'll sort of let you off without getting you in trouble, but then the second time they'll get you into big trouble. Also, what is the trouble you'll get into? Well, a lot of states have laws similar to Utah's, and in the state of Utah, for every day that you solicit donations without registering, all of your board of directors, your officers, and the people soliciting um, are, are deemed to have committed a Class B misdemeanor for every day of registration. So if you spend a year uh, uh, for every day without registration. So for if you spend a year soliciting in Utah and you haven't registered, then your entire board of directors has individually, each one has committed 365 Class B misdemeanors. This should be scary um, to you. It's not scary enough to nonprofits that fail to register, um, but it's a really big deal, and you have to make sure you're in compliance with this part of the law. So, you know, some questions we'll talk about in class. Should states be allowed to reach to other state entities and force requirements on them? Why or why not? And also, what are the benefits of solicitation registration? And are there drawbacks? And I kind of hinted that I don't think there are many benefits to these laws, but maybe we could talk about some other ideas. Anyway, that's it. I'll see you all in class.